What's going on, Wolfpack Nation? Welcome back to part two of our interview here with Tim Peeler, author, NC State writer and editor, specializing in university and, and athletics uh, history at NC State. If you haven't checked out part one yet, make sure to go and do that first and foremost, and then come right back here uh, as we continue our conversation about NC State history and, and athletics and, and everything in between, for sure. Um, but, Tim, so I do want to kind of ask, so in terms of, like, you know – I, I know, at least for me recently, it, it took a lot of convincing, but I think I might have finally broken through that Greg Haas, uh, you know, historian wall of his. And I think I might have convinced him that that Peyton Wilson is the greatest linebacker to ever play at NC State. I'm not sure. I think I might have broken through that, but <laughs> I know there's a lot of pushback with LeVar Fisher and Tony Burnett, even Nate Irving as well, which I think Nate Irving is more of. I do as a fan favorite, but I think honestly that if if Nate Irving could have played, I think it was his sophomore or junior year right. when he was recovering from that uh, from that crash. I think that he's he. I think he would have been right there easily, even probably above Lavar and and uh, and and D'Antonio Burnett. But I mean, you know, would you say it's outlandish take, or you know, or you know? Kind of, kind of give me your thought. I think, because I think historical wise, that's that's really the conversation we're having right now. Is where does Peyton Wilson belong among the all time greats? So he's certainly one of the greatest of all time, and I would I would come up with five names of people who would be in his category. Uh, you okay. mentioned um, Lavar Fisher. You mentioned Nate Irving. They would be in that list with um, with him. Um, two of my Favorite guys that I remember growing up. Um, Can I take a guess at one of them? Yes. Uh, you gonna go Bill Cower? No. No. Although Ooh. he had some great and huge numbers, he and uh, Kyle Wesco were two great linebackers on NC State's um, and those teams with Bo Ryan in the late seventies. Yeah. But uh, one of the first guys I ever covered as a young reporter for the technician. Was a guy named Vaughn Johnson. I was that was my next one, <laughs> and I have never been physically scared by anybody except for two people. One of them was Lorenzo Charles, who we just mentioned uh, in part one, uh, and Lorenzo was a big teddy bear. He looked scary as hell on the court, and if you went up to him and you surprised him, he would give you a look like you did. He didn't want you anywhere around him, but he had this big broad grin. Vaughn Johnson was the same way. He had muscles in his skull that he could flex and let you know he did not want to talk to you or he did not want you around. Um, he had to have a hard outer shell on the inside of his helmet to keep him from breaking the outside of his helmet because he was so strong uh, inside. Um, and, you know, I think it's time is going to tell about where Peyton fits into that list because Vaughn Johnson's best days were with the New Orleans Saints. Mm -hmm. um, Nate and uh, LeVar had professional careers, but their legacy was formed at NC State. Same way with Thunder Dan, who was a great, great linebacker. Um, but his legacy is what he's doing to make better linebackers now and better players now, a strength and conditioning coach. Mm -hmm. That's part of the legacy, though. Um <clears throat> With um, and the other one that I would I would mention in there is an underrated guy, and um, he uh, he's I just did a story on him, the most recent Wolf Factor. He's going through some things right now, but his name's Robert Abraham, great linebacker, played in the NFL for six years, uh, got a very rare disease, and now had both of his legs amputated above the knee. It's a sad story, but I've never seen anybody more positive about what he's going through than Robert has been. He was a great, great linebacker on some of those teams in the uh, early 80s, um, drafted in the NFL, um, was just very accomplished. And, uh, you know, I don't think it's <coughs> – excuse me. I don't think it's just what he did in college, but he did play um, on some teams and produced in the NFL, and I would put him up at that level. You know, at the, at the time, NC State did not have a national recognition, and people may not immediately know him at that level, but he was of that uh, accomplished. Speaking career. of him, I, I once heard a story that he actually split his helmet. Uh, is, that a, is that a true story? 
1970, I'm sorry, 1980, NC State played in Columbia, and he hit George Rogers the year he won the Heisman Trophy so hard that they both went backwards. Um, and Robert came off the uh, field and was trying to get his chin strap to tighten. He's like, my chin strap won't tighten. What's going on? And uh, somebody looked at it and says, Robert, your chin strap won't tighten because your helmet is going like that. That's how hard he hit George Rogers. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I'd heard that. I didn't know if it was – I mean, that's a little bit before my time, so I wasn't sure if that was an urban legend or if it really did happen. That's, no, that's pretty, that absolutely pretty awesome. Happened. And uh, there's somebody on one of the uh, fan sites who has that helmet. Oh, wow. I'd go for a bit. I'd go for a little bit for sure. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and, and obviously Tim, uh, you know, like thinking back to me in terms of my NC state history knowledge, you know, the first piece of NC state history, which I, you know, have ever heard was when I was younger and it really just became, it really, it, cause my, both my parents both worked for NC state athletics. I have a lot of family members of mine who have worked for NC state athletics, but have never gone to NC state. And, but, uh, you know, growing up when I was playing sports, I always wrote right-handed, but I always played all my sports left-handed golf, hockey, you name it. Mm -hmm. And so of course, you know, where I'm going with this, the first story, which I heard Mr. Charles Shackerford saying the famous words, I'm amphibious. And, uh, which I, I still love that story to this day. And, and, uh, and people saying, don't you mean ambidextrous? Yes, I mean ambidextrous, <laughs> but I'm going to say amphibious. But also, too, one of my, one of my favorite ones, uh, whenever I would do, like, tours of NC State campus for, like, potential students, um, you know, when I was at State or afterwards, was the 1911 building. And I would ask them, all right, can you guess what year the, the building was built? And they say, 1911. I say no, but <laughs> yes. So it, it was made for the class of 1911. And right. so, so I, I do want to kind of ask you, you know, kind of two things. First of all, what are your, some, what are your kind of the, what would you say is, are some of the most unknown, or I guess not as famously known facts about the NC state uh, campus? Like, you know, is there some that like when, when you've done your tours that, that you get the most like, Ooh, oh, okay. Didn't know that. Like, you know, there's some stand out to you. There's always some things that people find fascinating. And I found fascinating about how much um, NC state's campus changed in between world war one and world war two, the great depression era, um, the uh, federal works programs that came in and finished off uh, Riddick's stadium finished off the bell tower which stood only about 20 feet tall for 20 years on nc state's campus um finished off the tunnels underneath um, the railroad tracks finished off turlington and alexander and the dorms that uh, a lot of us know tucker and how much that had a huge effect and impact on what nc state could do you know nc state was founded as a um land grant institution to serve the um the people of north carolina we still are limited to only about 18 percent of every freshman class can be from out of state i am a native of north carolina my whole family trajectory changed because i decided to go to nc state both my sons were um accepted to nc state one chose not to go one chose to go um but it's all because my dad wanted to go to NC State, uh, was accepted in the class of 1957, got a full scholarship when it only cost about $600 to go to school there. All he had to do was pay a $15 deposit for his room. He came from a family of five, grew up in a literally a dirt floor cabin. He had absolutely no way of getting $15 to be able to go all the way from Lincoln County to Raleigh pay that money and go to school. So he had to find his own education. He promised me that, uh, and my sisters, if we wanted to get an education, he would find a way to pay for it. And he did. I'm the same with my kids now. They both have uh, much greater opportunities that I had because of my association with NC State, with their association growing up around NC State, having a good bit of the history um, and the artifacts that are in Reynolds Coliseum now, at one point, we're in my garage, uh, us trying to fix them up and restore them and do things. That's what their childhood was about. That's awesome. So uh, <clears throat> NC State changed me, changed my life the way my dad wanted it to change his. 
and it's been part of uh, my kids' lives, uh, my family's life ever since. Before we continue, I want to take a quick second to tell you about our sponsor, Flatlands Dress-Up Insurance Group, that has our whole world covered, with agents in five offices throughout eastern North Carolina to help you decide how much coverage you need, offering policies for home and auto, recreational vehicles, commercial, crop, health, life, and employee benefits. They are able to combine options to find a comprehensive solution that works for you. Flatlands Dress-Up protects the things you love so you can spend less time wearing and more time enjoying them. Find them on Facebook and Instagram at Flatlands Dress-Up. You can also visit their webpage at www.flatlandsjessup.com. So please make sure to go and check them out. All right, Tim. So I know you're a big golf fan. Uh, I follow you on Instagram, and I see you, you know, posting stuff from time to time, um, whether it's your, your your famous ball retriever that your dad gave you. Um, <laughs> if you could pick a, a, a famous foursome from NC State to go play at Pinehurst, who would it be and why? Well, I assume you mean living or dead. Sure, yeah. Um, sure, yeah. Richard Sykes never played a lot of golf, but he was the greatest storyteller. He was a 45-year, longest-serving coach of any sport at NC State history, and um, he produced golf champions. His friendship through the years, um, I know what he would be like on the golf course, even though he didn't play that often. Um, He would be at the top of my list to have on that foursome. Um, Obviously, Jim Vavano played a lot of golf and really enjoyed the game. Um, I was I, I didn't play with him at any at any point, but I was on the golf course with him when he played and was around him when he played. He used to go down to the caravans, um, you know, the Wolfpack Club caravans, and they would play those golf tournaments. One year, he uh, <laughs> he called his folks, the, his guys at ESPN, and re- they put it on Sports Center that night. Uh, I would love to um, include in that foursome Norm Sloan because I just would enjoy seeing what Norm Sloan would do to a golf ball if it didn't do what he told it to do. Mm. (laughs) Sidney Lowe used to tell the story about on his recruiting trip to NC State, he and Derek Wittenberg were in the back of Norm Sloan's car and uh, they were driving through campus, and they had just installed the speed bumps on campus. And every time they went over a speed bump, when they got to it, Norm would accelerate. And they would fly up in the back seat. And Sidney said he would always say, you can't let those things intimidate you. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Norm, Norm Sloan is the only person I've ever heard of who was almost arrested by his own bodyguard. I'm, yeah. I'm looking for the fourth uh, person I would have in that um, um in that foursome and I don't know, I would have to go with one of my regular playing partners just because they're always so much fun to play with Dave Droshak or Steve Elling, uh, some work colleagues that I have because they would make being with those other guys so much more fun. Mm. And so I, I do want to, you know, ask as well, like kind of two things. So uh, just to kind of wrap this thing up. So first of all, what would you say is the most, famous thing that nc state is known for in your opinion because a couple things come to mind between i mean a lot of people don't realize even realize it that i think you know i think one of the coolest things to to my opinion is the fact that we were the first one to cut down the yes like in my opinion i think in my opinion that's the coolest thing and honestly the most famous thing that people don't maybe most people don't know we're known for but we were the first to do it, but, you know, I was thinking about the Wolf fan, but I was thinking about just the 83 team in general because every single March it's always going to get talked about the 83. And, and before you answer that, is it true that we invented the alley-oop with David Thompson? That That is true. Um, that um, It wasn't necessarily David Thompson creating the alley-oop. It was that Monty Tal threw the pass up there. Sometimes it was Eric. Sure. Um, But the the person who threw as many alley-oops as Monty Tao did doesn't always get the credit for it, and that's Tim Stoddard, a major league pitcher who was pretty good Mm -hmm. with control. He could put it where David could get it and nobody else could. So that, cutting down the nets, the Wolf fans, is is a cool thing for NC State. Um, The, um, you know, the all of the the stuff surrounding 74. 74, um, the championship, it not only reinstituted freshman eligibility – it expanded the tournament. It brought the first uh, television contract, national television contract. Um, that team changed all of college basketball. That championship with Maryland and UCLA changed college basketball to make it more accessible to other teams, to create 
upsets. Same with 83. It created. There's never going to be another team that has played as many teams who are ranked number one as 83 did. Um, it's just not going to happen again. Those teams, they changed the, not only the fact that NC State won them, but they changed the college game. The other thing that NC State should always be remembered for, and this is a college athlete, a swimmer from NC State named Bill Toller, was the CEO of Hostess Brands Bakeries, and he brought Twinkies back from the dead. Twinkies were off the market. They were no longer being produced. Bill Toller became CEO of Hostess Brands, and he brought Twinkies back to um, shelves all over the country. Whether that's good health-wise, it's still a cool thing that NC State Athletics saved Twinkies. So, okay, so taking it maybe a step further than that, you just mentioned, you know, an accomplished alumni. Who would you maybe say, you know, every school has their most famous alumni or most accomplished? Like, who would you say would be NC State's? I would name a couple of people. Um, William Lee, General William Lee, who was the uh, first commander of the um, – um, U.S. Army Airborne, now the Air Force, uh, the Airborne down at uh, Fort Bragg at the time, Camp Liberty now. Uh, he does, he mm -hmm. planned the entire Airborne invasion of um, uh, on D-Day. Normandy, yeah. Huge, huge asset to the university. Was an athlete at NC State, served in World War I, was a huge part of World War II. Roosevelt came to his funeral. Um I would say that um, um, maybe Max Gardner, governor of North Carolina, also a football player uh, at NC State and North Carolina, only person who ever been captain of both teams. Uh, Jim Hunt, four-time governor of North Carolina, was the person who gave NC State the land for Centennial Campus, which was a game changer during my time at NC State, uh, the Centennial um uh, year of the university. And I, I think you have to certainly would include Christina Cook in that uh, list of top five graduates in NC State history. Uh, she is going to do something that no woman has ever done. Very few people, very few humans have ever done. And that, and she's going to be one of the first humans to go to the backside um, and fully orbit the moon. Yep, I agree. And last question, Tim, to kind of wrap this thing up here. So I wanted to kind of give you an opportunity with the fact that I'm sure all the time people call you historians or people, you know, ask you questions and things like that. You hear a lot of things. You've done your research. So what is one thing that a lot of you've heard a lot or that somebody's asked you a lot that is actually not true? That maybe it's something that, that a lot of people think is true, but actually is not true that you want to set straight right here on, 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 on a, a fully perpetuated myth by lots and lots of people uh, on NC state's campus off on television every March, just like you mentioned is that NC state had to beat Virginia and win the ACC tournament in 1983 to advance to the NCAA tournament. That is absolutely 100% not true. They had to, hmm. they were in, uh, and Dave Gavitt, who was the chair of the selection committee, told me this personally. They were in after beating North Carolina in overtime because that's the day after that that the committee had to go in and select the um, 54, uh, or I guess, 52 teams. Um, everybody says that still, that they had to beat Virginia and win the ACC tournament. It is 100% absolutely not true because of two things. Dave Gavitt was in the room. He was a friend of Alvani who knew that. And Vic Bubas was also a member of the selection committee. He recused himself from um, talking about NC State. He left the room, but he told me as well. They were already in. No, there was no question, no doubt whatsoever, that they were a NCAA tournament team after beating the defending national championships, being down by eight in the second overtime down in Atlanta. What is that saying? I was this many days old when I found this out. <laughs> Yeah, well, because 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 they even said it in the surviving advanced documentary that I mean, like the players like would say it on, on there that they had to win the AC tournament in order to make it. What, so, what Jim Valvano told crazy. the players that day, that Sunday that they went and played was, look, guys, we're this far. Let's go ahead and win it. Let's remove all doubt. Um, and the players yeah. went in with that mindset and probably all of the players on that team did think they had to go in. I, I talk wow. to me, I talk to the people who made the decision 
Yeah, for sure. Um, they would know. And, and they, sure. they knew and they, they said it without, without a whole lot of prompting. Wow. That's pretty yeah, amazing. That, that's uh that's about maybe the best answer we've ever gotten on this show. Like that is I think that I think we just found our uh, our thumbnail for uh this episode. <laughs> like, yeah, that right there. That was yeah, that's, that, that's a huge one. Well, Tim, I, I got one more. Well, I got one more. A fun okay. one, real quick. Uh okay. favorite uh favorite uh flavor at Highland Cow. Hey. So, I'll confess <laughs> that I I've, I've consumed a lot of Highland Cow in my life, as anybody who's ever seen me walking around can tell you. Um, I like anything that has uh, a combination of vanilla and cherry. I grew up eating cherry, homemade cherry ice cream all the time. Alan Cow has a nice vanilla okay. cherry uh, flavor, cherry vanilla uh, version. And because it's what I grew up with, that's what I always get. But there's not a bad one. I like butter pecan. I like all the ones. I live less than two miles away from the the creamery over on, um, um, you know, in the agricultural area. Uh, so yep. my family grew up on it as well. So I, I love it all. Gotcha. That's perfect. Awesome. Well, Tim, as I was saying, thank you so, so much for your time. Really do appreciate you coming on. We definitely got to get you back on again and have another conversation. This has been hugely entertaining for sure. As, I, as I'm sure I speak for all of our listeners and, and, and viewers as well that, that they found it entertaining as well. So thank you so much, Tim. Really do appreciate your time today. Anytime. I appreciate it. Thank you guys for, um, um, you know, lifting NC State Athletics, uh, telling stories, uh, doing the things that you do. It's important not to be always a fan of those things, but to be a proponent and an advocate for what NC State does, what it means, what it means to the ACC, to North Carolina, to college athletics. And I appreciate that. Amen. Absolutely. Yep. And, and then for all of our listeners and viewers, make sure you again go go check out uh, uh, Tim if you haven't already on Twitter at Pack Tim Peeler. And if you want to check out any of his works or books, check out timpeeler.blogspot.com. Uh, but with, and then for our end, y'all, make sure again if you haven't already, again hit that free subscribe button, hit that notification bell so you're notified whenever we release any new NC State content. If you enjoyed this conversation, if you were as mind blown as we were about that about that last statement, hit that like button and make sure you give us a follow as well at, at Tuffy Talk Now on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok, y'all. But thank you all so much for tuning in and go pack, y'all. Thanks a lot.